Hi, welcome to the mountains of Samaria, known as the Shamron in Israel, in the territory of Ephraim. Right over there, many of us know it as Shiloh, but in Israel they call it Shiloh. For 369 years, just down there, was the tabernacle. The last priest was Eli. He died the same day his sons died, just as it was prophesied. Samuel grew up there as a result of being dedicated by his mother, Hannah, who longed to have a child, and went and prayed just outside that tabernacle. God answered her prayer, and she responded by giving that son to the work of the Lord. The Road of the Patriarchs drives by it right now. Known here in Israel as Highway 60. Keep following down that road, you're going to hit Jerusalem. And just look at the mountains around Shiloh. Could you imagine back in the years when the tabernacle was here, before the presence of God was removed, on Yom Kippur, all these hills would be filled with the children of Israel, just looking intently, wondering if they might see the priest coming out of the Holy of Holies, wanting to see, wanting to hear him on that one day a year, proclaiming, the name of God. Here we are, centuries later. Right down there, we were harvesting grapes the other day. <laughs> Just around the corner right now, they're harvesting olives. Who's we? That's a good question. Can you imagine that we're living in the hour that the Word of God that teaches that those from the nations would come and tend the vines? Those sons of the foreigners will rebuild the ancient ruins. We read about it in Isaiah 61. That we're living in that hour. What's more is, is, is you can participate in finding that prophetic direction in the Word of God and, and entering into it and glorifying God's name in the process and wow, the presence that was down there for 369 years, it's like uh, clipping grapes off a vine, you're feeling. And when I say feel, I mean you are feeling the presence of God. How can't you, when you are fulfilling the words of the prophets, that were spoken centuries ago. Let's look at one. Let's look at Jeremiah 31. At that time declares the Lord, I will be the God. Beginning in verse 1. Of all the clans of Israel, and they will be my people. This is what the Lord says. The people who survive the sword and find favor in the desert, I will come to give rest to Israel. The Lord appeared to us in the past, saying, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I have drawn you with loving kindness. But take note of verse 4. I will build you up again, and you will be rebuilt, O virgin Israel. Again you will take up your tambourines and go out to dance with the joyful. Verse 5, take note. Again you will plant vineyards, on the hills of Samaria. See these vineyards? 
These are the hills of Samaria. Uh, many of the vineyards I'm pointing to you have only been planted in the last 15 years. Uh, some of them five, six years ago. You know, this is a, a remarkable phenomenon that seems to be taking place in these hills of Ephraim, territory of Ephraim, here in Samaria. That, in fact, just as Jeremiah spoke 2,600 some years ago, we are the generation. Yeah, that's you, that's me. We're living in this hour where these vines have been planted. It's more than that. They're not just being planted. They're harvesting the grapes. It's more than that. It's just not that they're harvesting the grapes. Those from the nations, as Isaiah said, I love it when the prophets start, you know, coming together. Isaiah said, the sons of the foreigners will tend the vines. We are living in the hour. More than that, they're actually making wine with those grapes. More than that. <laughs> that wine is being even sent into the nations. And people are uncorking a bottle, might I say, a bottle of prophecy. Why do I call it a bottle of prophecy? I'll tell you. For a prophet to speak these words 2,600 years ago and for it to be fulfilled, that is a bottle of prophecy. As those people, wherever they might be in the nations, drinking Sagat wine, wine from the Mount of Blessings, Mount Gerzim, as these people are uncorking these bottles of wine in this hour and pouring them to their glasses, do you know what? They are tasting and knowing that God is good. Look at verse 5 here in chapter 31. Again you will plant vineyards on the hills of Samaria. The farmers will plant them and enjoy their fruit. You know, I'll never forget, I was talking to one of the farmers not too long ago. And I says, is there a scripture, a scripture in the in your Tanakh, in your Bible, that convicts you for why you do what you do. And, and he didn't waste but a second, and he immediately went to this passage of Scripture and says, again you will plant vineyards on the hills of Samaria. The farmers will plant them and enjoy their fruit. And he pointed to the glass of wine that I was privileged and honored to take a sip from. And he says, what do you think of it? Are you enjoying it? I tell you, it's like the Bible speaking to me, speaking to us in this hour. And then he went further. He, he, he took us into the very next verse, verse 6. It says, There will be a day when the watchmen cry out on the hills of Ephraim. He says, You are on the hills of Ephraim. Come, let us go up to Zion to the Lord our God. And then he told me that word watchman, he says, is the word not serene in Hebrew. And he went on to say that when we, um, when we as uh, Israelis speak in Hebrew about you Christians or you Christian believers, he says, we use the word not serene. Well, I'll tell you, that was really exciting. Because, I mean, if I read it this way, there will be a day when the not serene cry out. I thought, hey, that's us. In fact, from his lips, and since then, for many other Israelis' lips, they're telling us that we are the Nazarene. Well, you know, it gives us direction. It says, there will be a day when the Nazarene cry out. What are they going to cry? On the hills of Ephraim. Right here, on these hills. Come, let us go up to Zion, to the Lord our God. Well, you know, I'd just love to do that right now. Just love to just say, come. Let us go up to Zion, to the Lord our God. You know, I don't think they could have said that about Shiloh. This, they couldn't have said that because Zion, you got to keep following that road. You got to keep, you got to keep on the road of the patriarchs, on the road that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob would have walked. You got to be on the road in which Jesus would have led his disciples. You got to be on that road. 
And they would say, come let us go up to Zion, to the Lord our God. I mean, that's, that's prophetic direction. Look at verse 7, I love this. This is what the Lord says. Sing with joy for Jacob. Who's supposed to sing with joy for Jacob? Is Jacob supposed to sing for Jacob? <laughs> this is what I love. You see, to open up the prophetic word in the hour that we live in, if we are those who have the eyes to see and ears to hear, we can actually open up the word and we can go, my God, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I can actually sing with joy for Jacob. Shout for the foremost of the nations. The foremost of the nations is in Canada. It's not America. It's not any nation in Europe. The foremost of the nations is here, Israel. We can shout for Israel. We can get excited about Israel. We can sing with joy for Jacob. You know, nothing wrong with singing those songs Jesus loves me, yes I know, for the Bible tells me so. Nothing wrong. But you know, the good news is, is we can learn some new songs once we come into relationship with the Lord. Once He's opened up our eyes, we can seek the Father to, to understand our destiny, to understand why I've been created. It's not about, I can't wait till I die so I can go to heaven. It's about, I want to fulfill every last breath the Lord gives me here on earth. I want to know why I've been created. Well, if you're living in this hour, I want to make it very plain and simple to you. If you're a father, maybe a grandfather, parent, grandparent, I want to encourage you to teach your children what time it is. It's one of the things my wife taught me. Shouldn't say taught me, encouraged me. That when I gave the first watch to our kids, was to teach them how to tell time. Show them where the big hand is and which one's the small hand and what, what, they, what they meant. I know it gets a little bit easier for some of you. You got those digital watches now. You just got to teach them how to count. But uh, it was one of my responsibilities as a father to teach my children how to tell time. Do you know how to teach your children biblical time? Do you even know what time it is? I, I want to encourage you to read the prophetic word. Understand that you're living in an hour when there is an Israel. Understand that you're living in an hour where Jerusalem down the street's being liberated. Jesus, when he walked as the Son of Man, walked into an occupied Jerusalem, occupied by the Romans. The Israelis today have liberated Jerusalem. It's the capital city of this nation. It's a city in which God placed his name on, and it's a city in which that king of the Jews is coming back to. Do you know that? I'll tell you. To be able to know that we're living in an hour when there is a Jerusalem and to know that the average disciple throughout history never lived when there was a Jerusalem. And we are. We need to teach our children this. We need our children to understand what time it is. Because you see, if we don't, and if we don't open the Bible to teach them this, then they might get their news on Jerusalem. They might get their news on Israel. They might get their news on what the media calls the West Bank. The Bible calls Judea and Samaria from your local media, from your national news services. And, and you need to know, they don't often open up the Bible when they talk about this area of the world. They, they, they'll talk to politicians and they'll discuss what should be done with this land. In fact, that city called Jerusalem. In many parts of this world, they want to divide. And, and the Bible has something to say about that. It, it, it speaks about anybody would even deal in those matters. They, they, they're, they're on very shaky ground. I want to encourage you to teach your children the prophetic word. Teach them how to sing more than Jesus loves me. 
teach them to sing songs that Jesus has a plan for me, and then help them to understand that plan by opening up the same word that Jesus looked at, because everything that Jesus said he was doing was in accordance to that which is written. Shouldn't be any different for us. It's a sing for joy for Jacob, shout for the foremost of the nations. Verse 7, make your praises heard and say, you know, sometimes some of us are secret believers in God's plans for Israel and the Jewish people. We don't want people to hear about it because what might they think about us? It's not popular to stand with Israel. It's not popular to love the Jewish people. And yet the Bible says all the way through we're supposed to do this. And yet, God says, make your praises heard and say. He even tells us what to say. You don't even have to come up with some of your own lines. God makes it real simple through the prophetic word. It says, make your praises heard and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. You see, we have to understand that there's a time for Jacob's trouble. We read about it in Jeremiah 31. And a lot of people believe Jacob's trouble takes place here in Israel. But do you mind if we just go back a page? Go to Jeremiah 30 and let's find out where Jacob's trouble takes place. It says in verse 7, How awful that day will be. None will be like it. It will be a time of trouble for Jacob, but he will be saved out of it. Let me read that scripture one more time. Jeremiah 30, verse 7. How awful that day will be. None will be like it. It will be a time of trouble for Jacob. Many of your translations have a comma or semicolon right after the word Jacob, which means the sentence isn't even finished. And yet, do you realize many doctrines have been created out of that half a sentence? And they even go far, as far as to say that there's a time when Jacob's going to come back to Israel and then God's going to judge them in a terrible manner. And I just really want you to take a pause there and let's just see what the scripture actually says before we accept a theory or a doctrine before reading it in the context of which the prophet spoke almost 2,600 years ago. It says... It will be a time of trouble for Jacob. Certainly there's a time of trouble. But he will be saved out of it. Do you see that? Trouble, but he gets saved out of it. That's good news. I mean, I, if I told you that, that there's, you're going to have some trouble, but if I told you in the same sentence you're going to be saved out of it, wouldn't that give you a little bit of hope? The trouble wouldn't be so bad. But if I just put a full stop at the end of there's going to be a time of trouble for you. And just stopped. Doesn't really give you too much hope, does it? So now let's, let's identify. Trouble for Jacob, number one. Number two, he gets saved out of it. Now let's try to discover where that trouble takes place. Verse 8, In that day, declares the Lord Almighty, I will break the yoke off their necks, and I will tear off their bonds. No longer will foreigners enslave them. Instead, they will serve the Lord their God and David, their king, whom I will raise up for them. That sounds like real good news. Read on. Verse 10, so do not fear, O Jacob, my servant. That's a big point. There's going to be a time of trouble for Jacob. He gets saved out of it. And the reality is that hope should be that he, he, be, he need not have to fear. So do not fear, O Jacob, my servant. Do not be dismayed, O Israel, declares the Lord. I will surely save you out of a distant place. Jacob's trouble doesn't take place in Israel. Not according to Jeremiah chapter 30, verse 10. It says, from a distant place. Let me read that verse 10 again. So do not fear, O Jacob, my servant, and do not be dismayed, O Israel, declares the Lord. I will surely save you out of a distant place and your descendants from the land of their exile. 
Jacob will again have peace and security, and no one will make him afraid. You got to understand the trouble that Jacob's going to have is in his exile, it's in his captivity, it's in a distant place, it's in the place that he was sent to because of his judgment. To understand that really helps us better understand what's taking place in Jeremiah 31. But let me read further. Verse 11. I am with you and I will save you, declares the Lord. Do you see that? That's three times Jeremiah tells Jacob he's going to get saved. Three times. And, and, and we're realizing now, or at least I hope we are, is that he's been saved out of a distant place. He's been saved out of exile. Though I completely destroy all the nations amongst which I scatter you, I will not completely destroy you. I will discipline you, but only with justice. I will not let you go entirely unpunished. I'll never forget when we were helping to bring the Jewish people out of the former Soviet Union, uh, Phil Hunter, God rest his memory, would often say to me, Dean, bringing the Jewish people home to the land of Israel is about saving their lives. To understand Jacob's trouble is to understand what Phil Hunter was saying. He helped bring over 100,000 Jews home from the former Soviet Union. He assisted and worked with the Jewish agency and many Christian believers that joined and partnered with him from many different nations. Saving their lives. Do you realize that this land here is for Jacob from the nation so that they would ultimately wrestle with God and become Israel. You could even talk to some of the Orthodox Jewish people in this land and if you mention Jacob to them, they'll say to you, uh, I once was Jacob. When was that? When I was living in the nations, when I was in my exile. But I really believe that now that I've been planted and taken root in the land, I've made my aliyah, I've made my ascent, I've returned to the land of my forefathers, that actually now I'm Israeli. I'm Israel. It's when the people of the land come together, I'm Israel. When they're separated, when, when, when they haven't come to that place of truly wrestling with God, they're still in that place of Jacob. Anyway, the greater trouble, judging by verse 11, isn't for Jacob, because Jacob gets saved. It says here, I am with you and will save you, declares the Lord, though I completely destroy all the nations amongst which I scatter you. I will not completely destroy you. I will discipline you, but only with justice. I will not let you go entirely unpunished. To me, that speaks about the nations ought to have a fear of God, a fear in such that we got to be careful in the nations how we deal with Jacob, how we deal with the Jewish people. Abraham was told by God that those that bless thee is going to get blessed. Those that curse you are going to get cursed. I want to encourage you. Recognize and identify that it pleases God to bless Israel. It pleases God to be their comfort. It pleases God to be merciful unto them. It pleases God to love his people, wherever they might be, whether they're scattered in the nations or whether they're already brought back home. So moving ahead, back to chapter 31, he says, Sing for joy for Jacob. Shout for the foremost of the nations. Make your praises heard and say, O Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. There's that word, save. God wants us to pray for their salvation from the nations, that they might be saved and brought back home. And you know when they're brought back home, I have to tell you, speaking to a guy like Tommy Waller, he'd say, every one of them ought to be planting a vine in these hills, in the mountains of Samaria. Every one of them should be drinking wine. And you know what? I think he's getting my attention. He might be a dirt man. He might call me a city slicker, but I want to tell you, there's something about connecting these people to this land. And God's enabling us. In fact, I would encourage you, if you're in the work of Aliyah, maybe you've been in it for years, 
get them home. Do what you can to help to encourage them and help them to come out of the trouble that is coming into some of the nations, even right now. Help to get them home. But don't stop there. Encourage them to plant a vineyard. Encourage them to build houses. I mean, we've got world leaders that are saying, don't build houses in these mountains. But God would say, build houses. Rebuild the ancient ruins. And he'd actually even say to you and I, if you're a son of the foreigner, come and help build. It goes on to say, verse 8, See, I will bring them from the land of the north and gather them from the ends of the earth. It's important to read this passage of Scripture to know that this is not the Aliyah from Babylon. This is the Aliyah that comes from the four corners of the earth, prophesied by many of the different prophets. It goes on to say, Among them will be the blind and the lame, Expectant mothers and women in labor and a great throng will return. Yeah, God wants to save them. That doesn't happen until there's a people like you and I that are praying that they'd be saved from the nations. I, I think one of the most important works of the return of the Jewish people, Jacob, from the nations, is that he'd be saved from the nations. He'd be brought home. That, we, that, that, that God's even told us to sing praises for him and ask him. Verse 8, pardon me, verse 7. O oh Lord, save your people, the remnant of Israel. God is asking us to ask Him to save His people. We play a part in that. We, we can bring them home, but before we bring them home, we've got to pray that God would save them. It says here, in verse 9, They will come with weeping. They will pray as I bring them back. I will lead them beside streams of water on a level path where they will not stumble. Why? It says here, because I am Israel's father. And Ephraim is my firstborn son. Wow. To sit here in the, the hills of Ephraim and to declare that God is Israel's father. And Ephraim is my firstborn son. What does that tell us about how God feels about this territory of Ephraim, these, this hill country of Ephraim, these mountains of Samaria? He makes a point in verse 10 by saying, Hear the word of the Lord, O nations. Can you please take a close look at that verse? And if you're the underlining type, underline O nations. You see, what I found really helpful for me was when I wanted to read the prophetic word, I would look for, as we talked earlier, prophetic direction. I want to find out the words that are in there that are for me in my household. As a father, I want to be able to, A, help my children know what time it is, but secondly, I want them to know what you do at certain times. Just like as parents, we say, it's at 7 o'clock, you're going to wake up, kids. Start by saying your prayers, redoing your devotions, make sure you have your shower, but you've got a little bit of time because at 8.15, it's breakfast time. And, and we lay out a schedule, a time. We tell them noon is when we eat and six o'clock is supper time. And those are the, basically the times we're gonna try and make, and, and at this age, eight o'clock, you've gotta go to bed. Time dictates what we're gonna do at certain times in a day. It's important as parents to be able to teach our children how to tell time, how to tell biblical time. And the only way we can tell biblical time is to be able to understand the prophetic word from, has this happened? Is this happening? Or is it about to happen? Is it still yet to happen? And I'll find that as you're reading the prophetic word when there is an Israel and there is a Jerusalem, <laughs> this Bible's alive. It says, hear the word of the Lord, O nations. Jeremiah wanted to know that this word wasn't for Israel. And when we read this word, we've got to be able to say, is this for Israel or is it for the nations? What time has this happened already or is it happening now? Is it something maybe I might be able to find some prophetic direction with? It goes on to say, not only hear it, but proclaim it in distant coastlands. You know, quite honestly, that's why we're filming what we're doing right now. We believe that this is part of fulfilling God's word for such a time as this. We've heard the word of the Lord, and we're from the nations. 
Now we want to proclaim it in the distant coastlands. And he says, this is what, he tells us what to proclaim. He who scattered Israel will gather them, and he will watch over his flock like a shepherd. For the Lord will ransom Jacob and redeem them from the hand of those stronger than they. And they will come and shout for joy in the heights of Zion. They will rejoice in the bounty of the Lord, the grain, the new wine and the oil. You know, it, it's so exciting to be able to know that as those from the nations were helping to harvest their grapes, their olives, we're, we're, we're actually... I got to talk to Tommy about harvesting the grain because I got, uh, it, it, it's, it's like I want to do it all. How about you? Don't you want to shout for joy for Jacob? Don't you want to pray, Lord, oh, save your people? Do, don't, don't you want to cry out on the hills of Ephraim? Come, let us go up to Zion. I mean, there is, in chapter 31, there is so much in Jeremiah that we can only, we can get to, only just a few verses and we can fulfill all sorts of words that's what God would have us do we have not only call, been called to harvest the grapes from those vines down there and the olives from those trees over there but we've been called to harvest the word of God just like Yeshua did just like Jesus did we have been called to be able to come and fulfill God's holy word in this hour some of you are saying I can't come to Israel fulfill it in the nations Get on your knees and begin praying. Start singing for joy for Jacob. You can fulfill God's word over there. But don't stop your children from coming. Don't stop your grandchildren from coming. Tommy wants 10,000 harvesters in these mountaintops. He wants to bring them in here and allow them to get their hands dirty and feel the word of God by fulfilling the word of God. It says... They will come and shout for joy in the heights of Zion. They will rejoice in the bounty of their Lord, the grain, the new wine, and the oil, the young of the flocks and the herds. They will be like a well-watered garden, and they will sorrow no more. I want to encourage you today from these heights in Israel, in the hills of Ephraim, here in this place the world will call the West Bank. God calls Samaria. Will you know what time it is? Will you teach your children what time it is? Will you look for a prophetic direction in entering into those words and be a part of what God is doing in this hour and, and, and find more life in your gospel that is more than just singing, Jesus loves me, yes, I know, but entering into the plans and the purposes that Jesus has for you. He is your light. He's opening our eyes. He's opening our ears. He's awakening us to knowing what time it is and entering into the harvest fields of His Word. Entering into the harvest fields of His vineyards and orchards. And yet, Jesus said in Luke chapter 10, verse 2, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Can I encourage you to be some of the few? Will you harvest God's word? Be a reaper of the words? sown and planted by the prophets? Can I encourage you to assist in bringing the Jewish people home? Isaiah 14 says that we will unite with them and we'll bring them into the land. Isaiah 49 verse 22 says the Lord beckons to the Gentiles to bring his sons in their arms and daughters in their shoulders. And will you encourage them when you bring them home to plant a vineyard and encourage them further and say, I'm going to help, help you prune some of those vines. My kids and me, we like to come and help harvest the grapes. Will you be 
those few? Jesus says, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. I hope you can close your time here after watching this little video by praying, Lord, save your people. Save them from the nations. Bring them home. And you could pray, Lord of the harvest, send forth your workers into the fields. And for some of you, you might even answer that call. God bless you from the mountains of Samaria. Mina basar u basar vehanolad.